Have you noticed that politicians struggle to enact the things they run on, that regardless of who wins elections, lawmakers find they cannot pass whatever legislation they like? They find themselves bound by what is popular, or at least their sense of it. They can only act within a narrow set of ideas, and that range is called the Overton Window. And on the Overton Window podcast, we look at issues around the country and talk to the people who change what is politically possible. Now, if you've been following the political debate uh, as long as I have, you've probably heard the uh, people warning about the dangers of federal deficit spending, and you've probably heard about this for decades. And some of you might be wondering whether it's actually a big deal, given that the sky hasn't fallen yet. Or has it? Uh, what is going to happen with federal debt and why? And there is no better person to talk to about this than Brian Riedel. He's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a former Senate staffer, and someone who I've been turning to for guidance on this issue since I was in high school. Uh, <laughs> And if you want a simple, compelling, and albeit depressing look at this issue, check out his chart book, updated most recently in November 2023. Uh, Brian, welcome. You just made me feel so old. <laughs> I mean, I assume you were pretty young back in 2000. Yeah, I, I, I arrived in Washington in 2001, uh, mm -hmm. directly out of graduate school. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, I, I feel old when I realize that now... It's been about 22 and a half years that I've been working in, in D.C. policy. It doesn't feel that long. <laughs> no, no. Well, I mean, a lot has changed. Back then, we were talking about government surpluses, and now mm -hmm. that seems like a pipe dream. Um, we've accumulated a lot of federal debt over uh, over your career. So what is the risk that the federal government faces over its debt? Well, right now, I mean, just just to give you a little bit of background right now, you know, when in the in the early 2000s, the debt was about 35 percent of the GDP. And we usually measure debt as a share of GDP because that tells you if the debt is affordable, just like your family's debt. We measure as a share of your family income. We measure the government debt as a share of GDP. It's it's gone from 33 percent or about 35 percent of GDP to 100 percent of GDP which is much larger than most other countries and also quite expensive. And depending on the fate of interest rates and the tax cuts, we could be heading to a debt going from anywhere to 200 to 350% of GDP over the next 30 years. The danger of that is, let's say we have a debt of 200% of GDP. At a 5% interest rate, you're paying interest alone of 10% of GDP. That means you're getting to the point where the interest on the debt is the majority of all federal taxes. And that's the danger here is the fiscal cost that, you, that we're gonna have to borrow so much money that most of your taxes are gonna go to interest. Or before we even get to that point, there's the question of whether we can even borrow that much money, whether there's even enough money to be borrowed from lenders to even to even do that. And so really the challenge right now is to get deficits and debt down so we don't face those terrible trade-offs. Uh, I guess since you brought it up, I'm kind of curious. If there was no one willing to lend the federal government money, wouldn't that help Congress do something about debt? Pretty it like would that would be a... Them crisis point that would actually encourage them to uh, consider the long-term consequences. It would force, it would absolutely force their hand. Um, and, and eventually that's kind of what we're facing. You know, just to, I'm going to throw out some numbers because I'm a numbers person. We're projected to borrow about $120 trillion over the next 30 years under the rosiest scenario, probably closer to 150, 160 which, trillion. Which by the way, I, I want to stop there. I work with state budgeting, and that's and we work in billions. One hundred and twenty trillion is just un, unfathomable to me. Yeah, the entire public debt right now, the debt held by the public right now, is about twenty six, twenty seven trillion, and we're going to borrow one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty trillion more over the next thirty years. When people say, "Okay, who are we going to borrow that from?" Well, China and Japan each have reduced their holdings to about one trillion of American debt. One trillion each. They're not going to borrow 120. They're not, they're not going to lend us 120 trillion. The Federal Reserve holds five trillion dollars in our debt. They're trying to reduce it. They're trying to dump their holdings. 
So if foreigners aren't going to lend us $120 trillion, and the Federal Reserve isn't going to pay the $120 trillion, then we're going to have to try to borrow that from our own investors. Um, Wall Street, bond funds, insurance funds, mutual funds, savers, state and local governments. There's a real question of whether the financial markets actually have the capacity to lend $120 or $150 trillion to Washington, at least at at normal interest rates, without interest rates going through the roof for everybody. And so this is this is really dangerous. What ends up happening, though, you said, you know, well, what happens if they can't lend us the money? The one danger is if they can't lend us the money, the financial markets, that instead of making the tough decisions, Washington just runs the printing press. Mm -hmm. um, then you just get really big inflation. But there's no good outcome here. Okay, so there's no good outcome here. I know this has been kind of a consist, uh, consistent theme about this because you borrow money, you kick your uh, uh, you borrow money now, you kick your problems to the future. The future comes uh, comes mm -hmm. eventually, and um, and there was a a book from this bankruptcy consultant uh, who was in Michigan for a while. Who, uh, was a uh, um, he called uh, the psychology living in the future. Because you mm -hmm. can always play with the numbers in the background of saying that, look, next year is or the future is going to be so much better. I can afford to deal with my problems since <laughs> then. And one of your problems is the future or one of the things that you're pointing uh, pointed out is that the future it doesn't look as rosy as it used to. Yeah, I mean, first off, I mean, the amount we're going to have to borrow in the future is so, so much more than our capacity. Like I said, you're going to have half even two-thirds of your taxes going to pay interest on the debt but even then we're not borrowing this money in ways that make us richer it's one thing when you're borrowing money for investments mm -hmm. it's just like for an individual if you're borrowing money to go to college okay you're going to make more money later in an economy if you're borrowing money for investment okay we'll make more money later we're borrowing money to give seniors more benefits than they paid in that's not going to make the economy bigger. That's not an investment. In fact, we're going to be diverting money from the private economy that would go towards pro-growth investments. So if anything, this borrowing is going to shrink the economy, raise interest rates, and then give us a huge bill later. And so the, the reckoning is coming. I, I can't tell you exactly if the, if, if the reckoning is going to be in three years or seven years or, or, or 12 <laughs> years, but mathematically... The numbers don't work over the long term. So something has to give. And uh, when you're saying borrowing money to give to seniors more than they paid in, what you're talking about are entitlement programs, Medicare and Social Security. Mm -hmm. And the way that the, the policies are set up is that we have taxing policy that puts money into the system. And we have benefits policies that pays money out of the system. And these things do not match. And the numbers are only getting worse. Yeah, I mean exactly. I mean, when I when I, it's, it's the numbers are actually pretty remarkable. There's a myth that you're just getting back what you paid in in Social Security and Medicare. Mm -hmm. That you pay these taxes and it's saved in a little fund for you, and they give it back to you when you retire. That's not the case. <laughs> um, Social Security and Medicare are pay-as-you-go plans. Today's taxes fund today's retirees. But there's also a myth again that you don't get back more than you paid in. In reality, Social Security recipients retiring today on average will get about 15 or 20 percent more than they paid into the system. And that's fully adjusted for present value, inflation and everything. Medicare recipients will get triple what they paid into the system. So when you put that together, the huge cost of people receiving as much as triple what they paid in. I mentioned the 30 year liabilities. Um, I mentioned the $119 trillion, specifically it's $119 trillion in 30-year borrowing projected by the, the, the Congressional Budget Office. Of that $119 trillion in 30-year deficits, $116 trillion of it is Social Security and Medicare shortfalls. Mm -hmm. The rest of the budget only has a $3 trillion deficit over the next 30 years. In other words, uh, about 97% of the budget deficit over the next 30 years is entirely from Social Security and Medicare shortfalls. The rest of the budget is nearly balanced forever. So we do not just have a broad budget problem. We specifically have 
a Social Security and Medicare problem. All right. So um, I guess it's a good statement of, of the problems that we've got uh, that we're facing right now, mm -hmm. uh, the mass and the massive volume load, and some of the ideas of like what could possibly change in the future to try to force our uh, lawmakers to do, uh, deal with this. But I want to talk about like, how do we get here? I mean, what were the political incentives that led to the uh, Social Security and, and Medicare having such huge uh, fiscal problems, and then just the level of federal debt in general. Like it, it seems that every crisis requires deficit spending. Yeah, I mean, two two things for Social Security and Medicare. The first, um, well, I guess a couple couple things on on how how we got here with Social Security and Medicare. The first is that over the decades, benefits were repeatedly expanded beyond what people pay into the system. You know, Medicare was supposed to be more funded by senior premiums than it was. And over time, Congress repeatedly expanded Medicare. They created a Medicare drug benefit, but mm -hmm. they didn't raise the taxes going into Medicare. On Social Security, benefits were expanded time and time again, particularly in the 60s and 70s. Benefits kept getting expanded so that started the problem. And then the second level is you add in 74 million retiring baby boomers and rising health care costs. You know, when Social Security was created, the average life expectancy was about 65. Now someone retiring into Social Security will live about 18 more years. Today, someone living until 90, which is not uncommon, mm -hmm. will spend one third of Thank his God. or her adult life collecting Social Security and Medicare. You add in the demographics to the rising health care costs, the costs explode. And so that, that's how we got where we are. We made the policies more generous, and then the demographics and rising health care costs added fuel to the fire. Well, let me, again, because I want to talk about the political incentives around this, is that, mm -hmm. the, I mean, these are all problems that we've, the like, People living longer, it's something that people have known for a while. And then the political incentives to increase benefits are always going to be huge. Like you're giving yep. some, some payments. Uh, uh, some people are really going to like that. And as long as you're not raising taxes directly on someone else, mm -hmm. there there seems to be very little political costs in making those decisions. Uh, so what else is what else is going on? Like why yeah. like these are known problems. These there there are known solutions to either do something about benefits or increase the payments going in, in into into the system. No one really wants to talk about that. There are actually our political costs for anyone mm -hmm. who says who who talks about this. So what else? What yeah. what else? The the politics of it have been peer inter. I mean to a certain degree interest group politics. Um, mm -hmm. seniors vote. Seniors mm -hmm. vote in much higher uh, proportions than younger individuals. And so senior benefits have always become s sacrosanct. And it's always been cheap to promise you, and you see this a lot in state government, when you promise big pension hikes during, you know, in, in bargaining, mm -hmm. where you say, we don't have money right now, but we're going to promise you big money down the road. Mm -hmm. And we're going to promise you big big uh, benefits when you retire in 10 or 20 years. It doesn't cost us anything now, but it's an easy thing to do. Seniors benefit um, uh, and seniors vote. And on the flip side too, of, of why they do this is there's still this myth out there that seniors are only getting what they paid back into the system and that seniors are, are, are impoverished and need every penny of this. Again, both are not true. First off, seniors, today's seniors, are the richest demographic, the richest age group in America today. Senior incomes have grown about uh, about five to ten times faster than, than the incomes of the taxpayers paying the benefits over the past couple decades. Some seniors struggle, but seniors are the richest people uh, right now. And... and the other thing is, again, the myth that I'm just getting back what I paid in. You can't touch my benefits because I'm just getting back what I paid in. It's not true. You're getting back a lot more. But that creates this, a sense, lockbox people people think there is in benefits that, that make it untouchable.
right. So you mentioned the state's problems with pension systems. This has been an issue I've engaged on. And here in Michigan, we actually had a lot of success at preventing the ability to rack up future unfunded liabilities mm -hmm. in these pension systems, something I'm very uh, proud of for having worked on. And we've talked with uh, um, uh, with Len Gilroy at Reason in the Past on this, mm -hmm. uh, with Reason Foundation in the Past on this issue. And what I thought was striking about that debate in Michigan was that there were already some legislators who were willing to take on the issue. Mm -hmm. And there was an executive who was willing to take on the issue. And once you had those two things, you could start to have negotiations. You could help them understand the, pro <clears throat> the problems that they were dealing with. And they eventually did something to do a lot to prevent their ability to rack mm -hmm. up unfunded liabilities. We actually have all of our retiree health care benefits for the school, large school retirement system. They're all pre-funded right now. Mm -hmm. um, we, we dug out ourselves out of that, out of that hole. Uh, so what are some of the political incentives that would need to change to get lawmakers to care about this issue? Lawmakers don't care because the voters don't care. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Voter, again, voters don't think it's a problem. Um, I get called every name in the book when I go <laughs> on Twitter or when I give speeches because voters still, again, believe this is not a problem. I am just getting back what I paid in. And voters also believe that this stuff can be solved easily. Uh, whenever mm. I talk about deficits, there is an obsession with finding the easy solution. We're just going to cut waste, just mm -hmm. tax the rich, uh, you know, cut foreign aid, get out of Ukraine, cut welfare, cut illegal, Im cut, cut immigration, raise immigration. Everybody has their easy answer. By the way, none of them add up. I mean, you could tax the rich at 100%. It wouldn't come close to being enough. You could you could eliminate the defense budget. You could deport every immigrant. You could cut foreign aid to zero. None of mm -hmm. it would even be close. But people have this. This. Uh, but by the way, let me let me stop you on on one point though, because I think it, it it's something I want to raise. It's like you're saying these are the major trends. Like it's Social Security, Medicare. If you're not doing something about that, you're not really going to be influencing your ability to <laughs> uh, to have catastrophic debt in the future. The federal government does do a lot of silly things. The, the, my little hobby horse is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative was not required to restore the Great Lakes, but it's not a billion dollar pro, or it's not a multi-billion dollar sure. program. So, and, so yes, there are some things you can improve, but you got to yeah. do the, the big Overall, things. people, I, I don't want to say that there aren't things we can't cut. I mean, mm -hmm. I entirely put out reforms all day long sure. of yeah. everything we can cut. But the point is, it doesn't get you off the hook. For the big mm. stuff, you know, I mean, look, you know, if you have a $500,000 medical bill, yes, you might want to cut out going to Starbucks every day because every little bit helps, but that's not going to solve the problem entirely. And so people won't motive, get motivated on this. Lawmakers won't get motivated until they're pushed. And the only way for them to get pushed is either voters want reform which frankly is not likely to happen because voters are getting a free lunch, or what will probably end up pushing reform is the financial markets. Eventually, the financial markets will cry uncle. They're going to say, we can't keep lending you all of this money. And that's how a, a fiscal crisis begins. It's when the financial markets essentially cut the drunk off at the bar, and then Washington can't borrow the money anymore, at least at a reasonable interest rate. So eventually that will happen. I would love for reform to happen earlier because voters see the problem coming and actually want to avert it. I'm, after 22 years working on this, I'm not optimistic that, that voters will be disciplined and, 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 and forethinking enough to do so. Okay, that's interesting because that is two different avenues to try to do something about this issue. Um, I, I guess... I want to be a little more explicit about the voters thing, because this, this is, again, like going back to the, the, the bounds of the Overton window are set by what is popular, at least politicians mm -hmm. sense of, of this. And every politician right now senses that it is not popular to talk at all about social security and Medicare. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they, the way that they view this is that if they even notice that these numbers don't align, they're going to be accused by their political opponents of kicking grandma off or out of the hospital. How did we yeah, get it, that far? 
And, and that's why, that's how we end up in this weird political moment. Last year, the deficit doubled to $2 trillion during peace and prosperity. We've never seen anything like this before. It was one of the, it was the biggest deficit in American history outside war, recession, and pandemic. And the deficit's going to $3 trillion in a decade. And yet you have Republicans, for instance, constantly railing about the deficit. We have the $2 trillion deficits. These are an outrage. The Freedom Caucus, mm-hmm. we need to do something about it. And then when you ask them what to do about it, they say, cut foreign aid. You know, defund Ukraine. Um, you know, they're go- Congress right now on the, the Republican House is going to war on one sliver of spending called non-defense, non-veterans discretionary spending. It is 10% of the budget. And it's the 10% of the budget that's not even growing very fast. Even if they get all the cuts they want, it just means that in 10 years, the deficit would be 3.1 trillion instead of 3.3 trillion. So we're in this weird moment where everybody wants to rail against the deficit, but nobody actually wants to solve it because if you actually want to solve it, you either got to fix social security, fix Medicare, or significantly raise middle-class taxes, or more likely all three, and no one will do that. So you have this dual thoughtless argument right now of we're, we're going to balance the budget by cutting foreign aid, which of course is, is silly. Mm. So uh, to go back to some of the political dynamics, it's at seniors vote, uh, seniors don't want their benefits uh, benefits cut. Like that makes this problem much harder. I guess uh, let's let's think this uh, think this through. I mean, you've also, you've also said that financial markets might not put up with this eventually, and then uh, you essentially that would be putting all Congress into a room and saying, okay, now you actually have to do something about this problem. Figure out mm-hmm. the most politically beneficial way of doing this. But let's say. Uh, let's say that you you are able to try to convince uh, voters uh, of this. I guess you get more young pe- younger people to vote. Uh, you understand that this this, this is a bigger mm. problem. And I know you're doing a lot to try to to bolster like the the popular support for this. But how do you get it? I mean, what what in, in the world can resonate with people about this, especially when it's when the harms are well in the future we might not be able to borrow and we ha- and, and we and all of our taxes are going to go to federal debt. You know, I'll, I'm not the first to make this comparison. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people in Washington have, but there's a lot of parallels to climate change. Young people are extraordinarily motivated on climate change now. You can't necessarily feel temperatures rising much today, um, but they have a view they, that the models say that regardless of little short-term fluctuations, in 30 to 50 years, things are going to get really bad if we don't do something now. And if we wait 30 to 50 years, it'll be too late. There's a really a lot of parallels with this. You have these unsustainable trends. Sure, and you know the current moment may have some ups and downs, but the long-term trend is pretty inescapable. And some people will say, "Oh, but you know this isn't science; these are just numbers. You never know what's going to happen." Not really true. I mean, <laughs> the 74 million baby boomers are not a theoretical projection. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they walk among us, they're hiring, and mm-hmm. their benefits have already been their payment formulas have already been set by law. This is not like an inflation projection where you never know. And so a lot of people in in this policy space are trying to figure out how to tap into the same foresight that young people use for better or for worse on climate change into this. Mm -hmm. As you can tell, we have failed miserably. (laughs) And the funny thing about the the public choice of this is young people can't go in and vote on some really awkward issues, and then seniors show up and vote on protecting Social Security and Medicare. And there's a certain way of looking at it that old people are are, are voting to rob young people while you, while the young people aren't paying attention, and they need to wake up. Hmm. All right. So I want to push or ask about one other thing, which is uh, in. <clears throat> Federal policy, like separation of powers, have been muddled. Presidents have an inordinate amount of power to do what they want, including now to apparently just spend money without congressional authorization. 
but that means that the the discretion that we've the, the power and the discretion that we've given given presidents could theoretically be used for some good too, right? Are we just one election from away from someone who could balance the budget? No. <laughs> um, I think there there are fights on this right now. Mm -hmm. President Biden has been using government to try to unilaterally increase his power to unilaterally increase spending. We saw this with the student loan bailout. We've seen this with SNAP, what used to be called food staff benefits, where the White House and the administration tries to unilaterally change payment formulas for, for benefits or cancel SNAP. Where the Republican version of this is... Republicans saying that we're going to try to do impoundment, where the government just decides not to spend money that was approved by Congress. They just say, we're just not going to spend it. Mm -hmm. That's, that might be one of the next fights in the next Republican administration. I think ultimately, though, the Supreme Court has been pretty bold and, 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 and clear that impoundment is not constitutional. And so we're back to needing Congress and the White House to work together. Mm -hmm. A balanced budget's not feasible. Um, we're not gonna we're not gonna eliminate a three trillion dollar deficit that's projected in ten years. Um, you'd have to essentially eliminate half the government. Mm -hmm. But what we can try to do is get the debt to stabilize at the current one hundred percent of GDP. That allows you to run budget deficits of about two and a half to three percent of GDP which would be today about 750 billion. If you can get the deficit down to about 750 billion, the debt as a share of the economy should stabilize. But you need Congress and the president to work together and having studied the history of congressional negotiations and, and published on, extensively on the history of deficit negotiations, it's not looking good. We don't have a lot of the, the elements that are usually present for these sorts of negotiations. Mm. Uh, so let's talk about some of the elements for those negotiations. I think key one's got to be an executive who wants to do something about this. And that seems to have been missing for 20 years. Yeah. I mean, the, the three, the three, I, I studied the 14 biggest deficit negotiations mm -hmm. since 1983. Um, six succeeded, eight failed. Mm. The three elements are number one. Uh, a penalty default, which means some sort of cliff you're coming to that if you don't come to a deal, something bad is going to happen. The bond market cuts us off. There is a fiscal cliff. There is, we're going to hit the debt limit. We're going to hit a government shutdown, something like that. Number two, public support, or at least not public hostility. And the third element, which has ultimately become the most important, is a healthy and motivated Congress and White House who are interested in the issue and can sit down and negotiate in a healthy way. Mm. If you get two, sorry, if you get two out of three, you will get a deal. Uh, penalty default, public support, and healthy negotiations. If you do not get two out of three, you won't. That that pretty much explains the success and failure of every negotiation since since uh, 1983. Mm -hmm. The hardest right now is the last one, the healthy negotiations. <laughs> you need a White House motivated and you need both parties in Congress to be able to sit down like adults and have good faith trade-offs. We haven't had a yes on the healthy negotiations variable since the 90s. Um, every negotiation has, has had a failing on that variable since mm -hmm. the late 90s. So uh, I guess... Uh... I'm a little more optimistic about this uh, than uh, than you are. You've already established that that there might be a penalty coming up because uh, uh, financial markets simply might not be able to lend the federal government as much money as as, as they have. Um, <clears throat> uh, popularity that's going to be up in the air. I mean, th the fact that you do have Freedom Caucus people m talking about the deficit might be something. I don't know. Like, I feel like. Everyone is already believes that debt's a problem a little bit. Why? Because they know that debts can be problems. And if their their leaders are reiterating that, yeah, you might you, you might get uh, get a much more forgiving American <laughs> public than than we've seen in the past. Um, and then uh, ne negotiations like 
I think it would be interesting to see a deficit hawking administration setting the the tone for their party. And uh, I don't know. I, that that one, I think, is, is kind of up in the air because uh, Congress is weird and I don't like it. But stranger things have, ha uh, have happened, as you've seen, like there have been successful instances of this in the past. Yeah, I mean, right, right now there is discussion of and there's legislation in Congress to try to do these fiscal commissions. Mm -hmm. There's bipartisan bills that say, let's get Republicans and Democrats together in a commission to fix Social Security and Medicare. That's a good idea, but it can only work if the commission actually has complete buy in from mm -hmm. the White House and all congressional leaders of both parties. Commissions fail when they're just kind of put in to throw a bone to some members mm -hmm. and leader says, forget it, ignore the commission. Yeah. I, I've actually worked on some of these commissions and there are members who are kind of backbenchers who are put on the commission and they have directions from their leaders that say, don't let anything come of this. Mm -hmm. If you want a commission to work, you actually have to have both parties totally committed from the leadership down to making it work. It always comes back to the commitment issue. If you can mm -hmm. get that commitment, that's a huge key. It can't just be a check the box commission. So let's talk about where the Overton window is on this issue. I think the default is growing expansive debt. Like that's mm -hmm. what you've kind of laid out is that unless you do something about this, uh, debt as a percentage of gross domestic product is going to keep increasing until something happens. Um, uh, you've got stabilize uh stabilize the debt which you think isn't it, it could be within the overton window uh right now it just requires those three things that you mentioned um and uh, obviously reducing federal debt is not in the window at all at 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 this moment yeah yeah i mean i think if, if you're look if you're looking at at where the deficit is going mm -hmm. um again three three trillion dollars in a decade we're not going to eliminate a three trillion dollar deficit and frankly we don't need to mm -hmm. if you can just stabilize the debt at the current share of gdp that's probably good enough and the political system may not see a reason to impose more pain than that so i think I mean, the Overton window is hard to define right now because right now there's no thirst for any deficit reduction at mm. all. Um, the Democrats, in fact, in fact, we're going to have in a couple of years a major series of fiscal cliffs. The tax cuts are going to expire. The discretionary spending caps are going to expire. Some extra Obamacare subsidies are going to expire. The infrastructure bill is going to expire we might actually see about a five trillion dollar bill expanding deficits in a couple of years uh and so i mm. mean unfortunately right now sometimes the best we can hope for is to just have congress not make it worse uh i would love to see a, a, an interest in making it better but the democrat or i mean neither party is really interested in raising taxes much um, Democrats on the rich only. Neither party is really interested in cutting spending in a serious way. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of in a holding pattern, except when they make it worse. Uh, so I guess this is part. This is going to be a frustration that I'm sure that that you had, which is like we're not really getting much for all this debt right now, as, as you've established, and it increases the risk of something catastrophic happening. Why is catastrophe so politically feasible? Why is catastrophe so politically feasible? Because our political system is not built to deal with crises until after it happens. People put it off. People, voters do not reward politicians who take preemptive action. I mean, we didn't take terrorism seriously until 9-11. You know, we didn't take the levees in New Orleans seriously until Katrina. We didn't take our pandemic preparedness seriously until COVID. If you're trying to put out fires that haven't yet spread, don't get noticed, don't get rewarded. And if they involve pain, they get punished. Voters do not vote with that kind of foresight. And so that kind of puts us in a political holding pattern. If a politician came out tomorrow and said, I want to, I want to fix these 30-year deficits, I'm going to put everything on the table. We need to fix Social Security and Medicare. We probably need to raise some middle-class taxes. And we're also going to do everything else. We're going to cut waste. We're going to cut defense. 
that politician would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. That they he or she would be destroyed immediately. That person wouldn't even win a primary. <laughs> Ultimately, the voters are to blame here. Um, we can talk all we want about political leadership, but mm -hmm. I worked on the Hill for six years. They go where the voters will let them go and where they can survive re-election, and we're just not there yet with the voters, which is why I'm out here trying to educate <laughs> voters every day, op-eds, TV, Twitter, not making a lot of progress, though. Well, it's a tough issue, but it's an important issue, um, and it's something uh, that we're going to have to deal with one, one way or another. So thank you for being out there and making this case, making it easy to understand uh, these issues, and good luck on your attempt to shift the Overton window. Thank you.